You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. So let's just say there's a planet of beings who never fell for, away from grace, and you were asked to prevent them from their own fall. Would you do it? Today we are talking about C.S. Lewis's space trilogy, where the main character Ransom is asked to do just that. Guys, this is Systematic Geekology. We are the Priest of the Geeks, and I am probably the biggest fan of this series on the team. I'm Joshua Noll. I'm also one of the co-hosts of the Whole Church Podcast, and I am joined by the other and better co-host of the Whole Church Podcast, uh, TJ Tiberius on Blackwell. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, man. So uh, what you been geeking out on these days? Man, there's always an answer. Uh, there are several things, but I'm going to have to go with Zatch Bell. Uh, I finished reading Zatch Bell yesterday or the day before, nice. uh, which is a good old manga series. Hmm, fun. I recently started Tulsa King on Paramount Plus, and I'm immediately a huge fan and trying to convince everyone to watch it. Uh, not for the faint of heart. It's got some strong language in there, but uh, apparently there was an old movie. So I'm trying to dig that up and watch that as well, because I really enjoy this series. Uh, the TV show has Sylvester Stallone as the main character, which is why I watch it in the first place. I love the Rambo movies. So I'm, like, yeah, I'm here for it. It's pretty good. Great acting on his part, too. But that's not what we're here to talk about. Today, we're here to talk about the Space Trilogy by C.S. Lewis. Sometimes it's referred to as the Cosmic Trilogy or occasionally the Ransom Trilogy. I feel like Cosmic might be the most correct, like if you're just like accurate term for the trilogy. What Maybe, do you yeah, I don't know. I like the Ransom. See, but but you know, not really the third one. Uh, <laughs> I want to say like he's he's not really even the main character of the third one. <laughs> but it's definitely in space. That's true. It is definitely in space. I think the only reason I like Cosmic is because it kind of deals with the creation of the universe. So it just feels more, I don't know, so, something about it. As Also, there's the fact that like his version of Venus and Mars just is not Venus and Mars at all. Yeah, well, yeah. that's, you know, in the 30s. Yeah, true. But he even, he says at one point, Lewis like, is talking about the series. He's like, yeah, I was not trying to be accurate. <laughs> None of this is based on anything factual. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he just went out and was like, I'm going to write a fairy tale. I'm just going to happen to be in space. Y'all don't yeah. know enough about space to criticize me on it, so I'm just going to say what I want. Yeah, he was just doing his own thing. Yeah, it's good stuff. Which is funny, because like, if you if you know a lot about Lewis, he was a big admirer of science. Um, his The book Miracles, he goes through like different arguments of like naturalism and all that stuff, and he really uplifts science and the importance of science for the faith. He was a big believer in evolution and evolutionary creationism. But this is a fun fact for this particular thing we're talking about. He was very anti, like vocally anti space travel. Wanted to prevent humans from doing that. No, yeah. he yeah. didn't want the space trilogy to happen. Yeah, not in real life, which is, is actually kind of cool, though. Like you can kind of tell if you read knowing that some of the stuff he writes in here that he's like, yeah, this is why this is a bad idea. <laughs> and I definitely think as we go through this conversation to it's important to keep in mind, he wrote this in the 30s. What sci-fi was pre-going into space was a completely different genre than what it is now. And he kind of plays on this motif. A lot of early sci-fi had to deal with, we're going to these other planets and we're conquering, we're colonizing, basically. England's still kind of recovering from the colonization mindset. And he's just like, no, that's actually that's actually kind of wicked. Let's not do that. That's That's bad. <laughs> And that's sort of what the whole first book is about. So there's three books in this series. Um, TJ, I don't know what all you remember about. I know it's been about two years since you read them. Uh, he borrowed my copies of them. But basically, the first one, he goes to, is it Melandra? Malcondra? Malcondra. Yeah. Malcondra. Malcondra, which is Mars. And it's basically at the, what it seems to be at the end of its cycle. And it, it's a planet that has never fell away from sin. But at least while he's there, death is happening. So that's kind of curious. Why is that a thing? Um, the way he gets to the planet is he's basically kidnapped by uh, Professor Weston. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's just Mr. Divine is his last name, right? I don't remember yeah. his first name. But yeah, just it sticks in your mind that it's Divine because you're like, hmm. But it's spelled D-E-V-I-N-E, I think. It's weird. Um, yeah. Anyway. Veen. Yeah. They basically kidnap him. Because he catches them kind of doing experiments or something on somebody. And he's like, hey, this is this is kind of messed up, guys. And then they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. 
here, drink this cup of coffee. And then he drinks it and it drugs him and he passes out and wakes up on a spaceship. They take him to Melicandra. He, he overhears them wanting to sacrifice him, which is funny because it's ransom. Um, so when he gets there, he sees them and some other aliens and he just takes off running away. Um, I forget how long he spins on Mars, but Mars is kind of layered. So on the surface layer, it doesn't look like there's life. But as you go through, there's different sections of Mars, different kinds of life. Three different alien races, the Herosa, which kind of look like otters or seals, the Saroni, which are really like 15 tall, thin humanoid creatures. And 15 then, tall. 15 feet tall, yeah. <laughs> How do you say this last one? The fifth look triggy? <laughs> uh, you know. I think he was just triggy. trying to be goofy at this point. Fifth but they have like triggy. a turtle head and frog body. It's weird. Um, yeah. C.S. Lewis certainly makes this whole thing very alien all the way through. Like, he's like, I'm just going to make this as weird as possible. Yeah, it was definitely creative. Yeah. One thing that stood out to me in the first book, too, was whenever they're first in space, he's like, I want to panic. I want to freak out. But he's looking out in space and it's not dark as you would imagine it is. He says it is colorful and colors that you've never seen before. And it was just really cool how Lewis depicted space as this beautiful, colorful place, which now we know that that's not the case. But yeah, but that's it's like the exact opposite reaction William Shatner had when he went into space in real life. <laughs> which, yeah. if you don't know, he was basically like, man, this sucks. <laughs> man, he's not meant to be out here. Take me back to Earth. That's funny. I did not know. That. Yeah, I know. It terrified him. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, so anyway. End of the first book, the, um, the Oyarsa, which is like each planet has their own Oyarsa, which are basically angels. Um, the Oyarsa of Mars takes them and kind of tells them this whole spiel of, yeah, we never fell away from sin. Your planet did. Your planet is the silent planet, which is why it's out of the silent. Because once it became sin, it was no longer able to communicate with the other planets and their Oyarsa. So they were discommunicated from the rest of the cosmos. Um yeah, basically, he gets this whole spiel, and they're like, yeah, so we, we just kind of need you to go back. Weston doesn't like it. They're all kind of begrudging about it. They end up having to get a lot closer to the sun to get back to Earth and almost don't make it home, but they make it home. That's the first book. Pretty simple. Weston was very much, we need to colonize this planet. Ransom was like, no. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't do that. Hey, had the Oyarsa wanted Ransom to stay. Did he? I yeah. didn't remember that part. Yeah, but he just, he decided not to. Yeah. He was like, yeah, no, I don't belong here. I'll leave. I'll go with them. <laughs> That's funny. So second book starts, kind of picks up real, pretty abruptly. C.S. Lewis makes himself a character in the, in the book series, and he's one of Ransom's like students. And Ransom's telling him, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm basically, I'm getting ready. I'm being sent on a mission. They need me to go to Venus uh, or uh, what? <laughs> Venus isn't called Venus. It's Venus is called Perilandra in this. Yeah. Earth is Falicandra. Or Folic Folicandra? I don't know how you say that. Yeah. Paralandra uh, is the title of the second book. Yeah. So he's going to Paralandra, which is Venus. Um interestingly enough, the whole trilogy starts, which is the same thing with Narnia. C.S. Lewis had a image in his head and built a story around this image. And the image was the floating islands that end up being a part of Venus in this story. Um, for those who don't know, it's the Paralandra. It is not fallen yet, but Earth's Oyarsa we know as Lucifer is sending people over, sending stuff over to tent the Oyarsa and the people of Venus to fall like earth fell. Ransom's being sent to stop that from happening. So we're stopping them from eating the apple. But in this case, it's not eating the apple. God had these people. You can do whatever you want, but whatever you do, all the islands move, except for there's one place that's stationary. Don't stay the night on that island. Pretty simple rule. Just like, you know, don't eat a fruit. Pretty simple. Yeah, pretty easily avoidable. You would think. Yeah. Um, I, I personally, I think C.S. Lewis is kind of getting at something here where it, Adam and Eve on our earth were tempted to be like God. And I think it says something that here, what he envisions being like God is, is staying at the one place that is stationary, that isn't being moved around by the God. So I just think that's some interesting imagery to think about. Um, so he gets to Venus. He's supposed to stop it. Who shows up other than Weston? Weston is back. Weston ends up being possessed by a character known as the Unman. Pretty straightforward what that means, right? Um, 
now Weston does this whole argument of, yeah, no, I don't think we need to colonize anymore. Now science has discovered spirituality. We've discovered truths and stuff like Buddhism and all this. And there's this dualism and I've been taken to the dark side. So, you know, we're going to just kind of introduce dualism here. If everyone's good, let's introduce some bad. Even it out, you know, balance the force. Ransom like, yeah, uh, or no bad. Let's just not have bad. What do you say? Obviously, they don't agree. Ends up with this really brutal, like, to me, one of the most captivating scenes I've read in any book is where Ransom is basically forced to strangle Weston to death. And they do it in this cave that's underneath the island that does not move. And in the end, he prevents Venus from falling. He's sent back to Earth. And that's where you have the last book. You're introduced to the NICE, the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments. And what's weird is Ransom's kind of not the main character here. You have these characters, Mark and Jane, just this re random regular couple that's kind of basically choosing between, you know, the good guys or the bad guys. You have a lot of like human politics and organization kind of stuff coming up. The last book is really, really dense. I really don't know how to summarize it well. It's really dense. <laughs> so and many people complained. C.S. Lewis wrote his own abridged version, and it still wasn't that abridged. Yeah, and it's completely reliant on the context of the first two books. Yeah, yeah, that's so, true. You could read it without reading them. I don't know why you would. Yeah, yeah, it, it's interesting because it is kind of its own story. And a lot of my complaints about Narnia, which, you know, if you're on Patreon, you've heard our Narnia versus the Space Trilogy argument or debate, whatever. A lot of my complaints about Narnia, of how there's too much different types of lore thrown in one, definitely can be said about this book specifically. Not so much the first two, but this one, we still have all the space stuff going on. You have a talking bear character. And then Lewis is like, you know what? Also, they're going to find Merlin. Yeah, Merlin. Let's introduce Merlin to this <laughs> for some reason. And Divine shows up. There's this whole organization of the NICE. There is a lot of moving pieces, a lot going on. A talking head at one point is a big part of the story. Just a disembodied head speaking to you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, this is like, he wrote this at the very end of World War II. It's crazy. Yeah. Which is mentally, it's got to be a rough time to write a book. Oh, yeah. And, and I think it's actually really telling when you think about the fact that it was at the end of World War II. And one of the big things in here is, you know, the characters are asking the angels and the demons and all these other things like, well, what's the right side? What's the right political side? Talking about England right after the war. You have Winston Churchill. Should be pretty easy to say that's the right side. And yet, with the angels and stuff, what C.S. Lewis writes is they say, there isn't a right side. We just choose whatever's most beneficial to us at any moment. And that goes for the angels and the demons and then Lucifer, everybody. And I just feel like that, honestly, at that time, where it was the most easy to pick a side, it speaks volumes. Now reading it at a really polarizing time in history to say, oh, even then, we, you know, people like Lewis were able to recognize it's all just pieces. It can all be good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's my basic breakdown. Did you have anything you needed to add to how the three kind of go go down? Uh, not really. Uh, but I, I will say if you're going to read these, get ready. Yeah. No, you're going to read a lot of extra words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lewis does that. Out of the Silent Planet starts. And maybe I think in the second paragraph, he's describing the pedestrian. and. It the sentence that explains the speed that he's walking at is like twenty something words long. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about earlier. He could have just said he woke, he walked briskly or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Funny. Or he took off at a brisk pace, like anything. Yeah, funny, funny stuff. Um, also, what's funny to me, on top of all that, Ransom, according to Lewis, was sort of based off of Tolkien, yeah, the person human Tolkien. And it was really funny to me when I heard that, because when I first read the Out of the Silent Planet, I kind of read Ransom as me. I usually don't read the main character as me, but it just so happens that this guy is like big into words and like that kind of stuff. He's not really a science guy, so he's not like smart in that kind of way. And he starts off just on this really long walk. And if you know me at all, I walk a lot for no reason, no reason at all. So I'm just like, yeah, this is a character I was able to relate to. And I'm like, yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that that's Tolkien for some reason. Um, so TJ, how did you first come upon this trilogy? Like what was the first time you ever heard of it? So I had heard of it before. Uh, I think from other kids who read too many books, like, yeah, oh, C.S. Lewis, I read Narnia and then I read 
you know, the librarian told me I should read his space books. I don't yeah. remember who I was talking, but I do remember hearing about it in like high school, but I never read them until yeah. uh, my friend Josh had uh, the omnibus copy and I borrowed it and I read that a couple years ago. Yeah, me. I'm the friend Josh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The book I, um, is behind him. I can see it. What, can you Can you really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That checks out. I, our friend, both of our friend, Izzy, is how I first heard of this. And I don't, I don't know how it came up. I read a lot of Lewis and somehow I never heard of the space trilogy before that one. And I feel like Pilgrim's Regress both get like ignored, but he was like, Hey, you know, he wrote a sci-fi trilogy. I was like, what? So I went out and got it and I read it. I think I've read it three times now. I haven't read it a ton, but I do I really like it. The problem is like teacher said, it is very wordy. So it's one of those things that's like you read through once and usually I think this is true of most people. If you're going to reread it, you basically only reread Perlandra. Now, like, I know what happens to the rest of it. This is just the easiest part to read. So if I'm going to read one part, Paralandra is its own story on its own, the second book. And it has such a good climax that you really don't need anything else. You can just read that one. At least that's how I feel about it. Yeah. So, I would almost recommend it. <laughs> you would almost recommend yeah. only reading Paralandra? Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, I could see that. Um, I think a lot of people do that. Anyway, so... We, we talked about Ransom. He is a, uh, what's it? He's a literature professor, I believe. Mm-hmm. Who are, who are the other main characters on this series that you remember? Uh, Weston. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Devine. I always call him Devine. That's not divine. Could be uh, Devine. I remember them from the first book. Uh, and I, I remember Jane mm-hmm. and her husband, Mark from the third book. Yeah. And Studdock, Dr. Studdock, I think was his name. Stubbuck, one of those things. One, one of those two names is a character in the third book. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like that's basically all the main characters. Um, interesting enough, in the third book, Divine or Divine, whatever, however you want to say it, he changes his name to Feverstone or Feverstone, and you don't realize it till like halfway through the book, I think. And Ransom, for some reason, changes his name to Fisher King. Do you have any idea why he calls himself Fisher King? None. Me neither. Like, I felt like there had to be some kind of, like, literary, like, reference or something that I just wasn't picking up on. I was like, what? Why Fisher King? Ransom sounds cooler than Fisher King. I don't get it. Uh, Yeah, but Weston, you mentioned him. He was the, like, the big scientific mind. So he was a professor as well, but a professor of science, all for space space travel, colonization, that kind of stuff. Which is part of why C.S. Lewis makes him the bad guy. Because remember, Lewis is anti-space travel. Mm Mm-hmm. So he's like, yeah, that's going to be the bad guy. Pretty interesting. Um, and then I also know if you read through like stuff like um, Mere Christianity, Lewis talks a lot about for him how short of Christianity, dualism is really tempting to him. Like it makes a lot of sense to him. This kind of idea that there is both light and dark. They're both needed. And neither one are necessarily evil, that kind of stuff. So it's interesting that the scientist becomes sort of this spiritual dualist in the second book. So more or less, he just makes Weston all of these things that he doesn't like. That's who Weston is. And I, and I kind of wonder if it was even cathartic for Lewis to write that scene where Ransom is strangling to death this character that basically embodies all the ideas that Lewis doesn't like. Yeah, I have to imagine so. Yeah, this is probably fun. Like, yeah, he really all of these ideas are dead now. Yeah. And, and really, that's why I feel as though. The second book's really the last, like, that is the final chapter for Ransom. Like, yes, Ransom is in the third book, but almost more like when you pick up a new trilogy that had old trilogy back, you know, like the new Jurassic World movies, and they, like, have some of the old characters that are, like, legendary characters. It's no longer their story, but they're there, you know? Yeah. That's kind of what he feels like to me in the third book. He's there, but it's not his story. Um, Let's see. Let's see. We, we talked about the aliens on... um on Mars or Melicandre, but on Paralandra, we didn't talk about all them. Uh, the main ones are the Torlindri, which are these like green. They're always naked because remember they hadn't fallen away from grace. So they don't know sin. They don't know to be ashamed of their nakedness. So they're green. They're always naked, which leads to some really interesting cover art. If you look at all the different covers that happened for this, none of them are like explicit or bad or anything. They're just kind of funny to me. There's merfolk. There's just mermaids and mermen on Venus apparently. And at one point you see, the Erkstree, which is this giant beetle-like creature. So that's pretty cool. 
Um, what a do you, can you think of any other secondary characters that you like just really thought were cool? You really dug? Uh, I think the the Oyarsu are like fairly interesting in the fact they like they have their own personalities. That's true. Yeah, it was cool. Except for Lucifer, I didn't like his personality. Oh yeah, you know, but he still had one. That's true. Which yeah, it's just you know you don't think of him that way. What did you think in the last book? What did you think of? Um, do you remember Mister Boltitude, the the bear? I remember there being a bear. Ransom has a pet bear for some reason, like out of nowhere. He's just like, I have a pet bear now. And there's an entire chapter of the last book that's told from the perspective of the bear. <laughs> like, why? Why did Lewis do that? Just good writing. <laughs> yeah. Cracked me up though. I just thought it was funny. Well, you know, that's that's classic sci-fi. There, you just go all ridiculous in that last book. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. Let's see. What were some of the other ones I really liked? I liked Mister Boltitude. I liked the head. So, uh, Francois Alcansaw, however you want to say it, French scientist, had his head chopped off. He's a talking head now. Except for it's not actually him. They were the Macrobies or Macrobies, however you want to say that. They were using his head as like a mechanism to speak. Because they're an entire species of aliens with no bodily form, and they exist between the planets, so they don't belong to any planet. So I thought they were super cool. Um, as far as like species like that, is there any like alien race or anything that you thought were just super cool? The uh, the Saroni, just you hmm. know, something about being fifteen feet tall and having seven <laughs> fingers on your hands. That seems pretty sick to me. And they're all skinny. Yeah. Why couldn't the human race all be skinny? And 15 feet tall. For those who don't know, I, I put on a lot of weight. I make a joke about myself. Not fat shaming. And they also... Except for myself. They have feathers? What? I don't remember that. Pretty sick. Yeah, they have feathers. So they're just giant big birds with seven fingers. Essentially. I like it. I'm a fan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, that, that design was pretty cool to me. Yeah. And what I really liked is how often Lewis would take his time to be like, I can't really describe what this alien looks like to you, but here's the best I can do. And yeah. even like in Venus, he even says like there were colors that he saw that he couldn't describe to you because, you know, how do you describe like red? You know, red is red. <laughs> it's like, I just saw this other color. I would know it if I saw it. Yeah. And it was a whole new experience. And I think that's something that they could do then that maybe you can't do now. Is just really imagine the unimaginable when you come to space because everything is not going to be exactly like it is on Earth. You know, so far, if you're doing like fantasy and stuff, you're imagining different versions of what we have on Earth. You know, you have centaurs are just horse plus person, unicorn, horse plus horn, <laughs> you know. But once you get into space, all of a sudden it's like this should be stuff that looks nothing like what we have here. Yeah. Also, I feel like it's a it's a pretty easy cop out. That's true, too. You just can't think of like a good way to describe your alien. You just don't. I do like that. Yeah. Also, I still just like. When I first read, there was just a color that I really liked, but I couldn't tell you what it was. <laughs> that to me, I was like, man, some part of me is always going to be like, what? what was that color? Like, obviously, he didn't have an actual color in mind, but my brain being my brain, I'm just always wondering. <laughs> it's probably What's chartreuse. Like? Yeah, that doesn't exist on Earth. No, it shouldn't. It's a good one. Good one. Oh, man. So moving past alien races, kit and all of that, what do you think was the most impactful part of the story for you? There's anything that stands out. So when probably when he's forced to strangle Weston, you know, it's not he's not really forced. He just feels strongly led. Yeah. But uh, definitely strangling Weston, like getting the, a, a divine command to strangle Weston. Yeah, that was going to be mine. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely the most like like I saw something about the way it's described and stuff, too. Like it's like gut wrenching. It's powerful. And I feel like it's particularly meaningful. His sacrifice, his ransom that he had to pay to keep that planet from sinning was to murder someone. Yeah. Gruesomely, too, yeah. by the way. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't just choke him. Yeah. No, it's, he throws him into a, a pit of lava. Yeah. Yeah, it gets pretty real. Yeah. Um, if I can't say that, and I've already mentioned the uh, how he described space is really colorful, I think the, the, the other most impactful part to me is near the end of that hideous – that hideous strength. They kind of make it a point to show you, to say more or less, evil will not be defeated. You kind of expect to come to the end of this and Earth's Oyana, Earth's angel to be replaced and, you know, there'd be a happy ending. And it's like, no, actually evil can't be defeated here on Earth. We can limit it. And then it is up to these, this Mark and Jane, 
to simply decide to be good. And it's up to all of us. Like, we're going to limit evil. And then it's just up to every ordinary person, ordinary Mark and Jane out there, to just decide to be good. There isn't a clear, you know, resolution to it all, which I kind of liked. I think it aggravated a lot of other readers. But I kind of liked that because it makes it a lot more real. I feel like it's almost lazy writing to be like, oh, we replaced Lucifer and now you get Gabriel and everyone's happy. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the moments that we appreciated. Let us know if you got anything that stuck out to you guys when you read this book, if you've read the book. Um, but I did want to go through and see if you saw some of the same themes in the series that I did. And some of it we kind of already talked about. But I feel like there was a big theme of humanity and what it means to be human. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. I, we're seeing alien worlds through the eyes of a human. Yeah. And part of what's interesting there, too, is when Lewis shows the unman possessing Weston and Paralandra, he starts killing these other things, these creatures, these aliens and these animals. And I think Lewis, what you really see, even with the bear in the last book, you see Lewis really equating all life as important, not necessarily the same as human life, but he's all life is important. Killing is unhuman. It's unman. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, in the first book, trying to colonize another planet and to, you know, reassert yourself as opposed to honoring the life there. I mean, that's part of what it means to be human. And it's just it, it, interesting struggle there. Same thing with yeah. science was my next theme. Yeah. Well, I mean, for like, even in the first book, as far as humanity goes, they make it a point to show that the three races that live on this planet, the three now that live on this planet, the sentient races, uh, respect each other, acknowledge that they cannot do what they all do without each other. Something that uh, some may find distinctly inhuman. Yeah. Which is something that you would think that the uh, the two church unity guys, <laughs> you know, our other podcast is all about church unity. You think that would be the part that we really harped on. Well, yeah. Here's a planet where everybody was different and still united. Wow. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Everybody go read uh, Out of the Silent Planet by C.S. Lewis. Then we'll all be united. One church. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that was, I didn't even think about that. And even, even in the last book, when you see the NICE, you see this humans organizing and how organizations can be good or evil. And it mm -hmm. depends on the actors, the humans, the humanity of it all. Yeah. Then you have this whole theme of whether science is good or bad. You see a lot of how Lewis relates to science where he clearly has huge respect for it. And at the same time, thinks that we can go way too far. Yeah, I think science is pretty much bad. All right. Yeah. For those who don't know, uh, TJ was a biology major. Yeah, science bad. TJ likes science. <laughs> don't listen to him. Um, politics, we already mentioned how that was like a big part of the third book. Here was another one that I thought was a really big key. Obedience. It's not that people really don't like to talk a lot about, but I feel like that was a huge part of these books. Because you see Earth, we didn't obey. We ate the fruit. And you see Paralandra, and the whole thing is about Convincing them that it is good to obey. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's basically the theme, the overarching theme of Paralandra, at least. Yeah. Because uh, like, hey, you guys made it this long without sleeping on the fixed land. Why would you even bother doing it now? Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's weird because it seems so nonsensical, right? Like, oh, I didn't just sleep on this other land. That's, yeah, whatever. Why just everybody avoid that one piece of land? But there is something about the metaphor of it all, which, you know, I'll say, I don't think these books were allegorical, but they definitely have metaphors within them. And there's something about that metaphor of, yeah, we want to feel like we're on solid ground. We want to feel like where we're standing can't be shaken. And that's something you see, honestly, you see a lot in like Christian literature and Christian books and songs and whatever is I cannot be shaken. I am on solid ground. I am with God. And yet what you really see is all throughout the Bible and in this book is being with God is Yes, you can trust in him, but you also know that God might take you anywhere. Christians, uh, you know, the followers of God are like the wind, the Bible says. You don't know whether they come or where they're going to go. And here's the thing. If you were the Christian, you don't know either. <laughs> God tomorrow might be like, oh, well, I'm sending TJ to Canada, and he'll find a way to get TJ to Canada. And TJ yeah. will watch more hockey, which is amazing that that's even possible. Probably not. It's so expensive. To watch hockey? Well, I mean, in person. Yeah, I just meant like you'd watch more hockey in general. Maybe it's possible. Yeah, maybe more like. Do they have I'd, other leagues of hockey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I'd go to more minor league games, probably. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. But the the point is, 
At any point, I could just decide, no, oh, this has happened to you now. And that is something that we have to wrestle with that none of us like. All of us like the idea of being in control of our own lives. And yet, that's not what we're called to do. Yeah. And one thing that I thought was just fascinating, speaking back to that theme, also in Paralandra, when you see Ransom being called to Venus, he even says, I don't know how I'm being called or how I'm being sent. I have no idea why I know that I'm supposed to go to Venus, <laughs> but I'm supposed to go. So, <laughs> yep, and that's just how it is. Yeah, that's how and, it happens. Yeah, not not to bolster too much my uh, my co-host here, but I actually think TJ might be the only person I know that I could say for sure. If he just kind of felt like God was sending him to Venus, he would just go. I'd have to. Yeah, he just kind of works. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's got the most. Uh, what was it? The casual spirituality. Yeah. God wants to do something. He's just going to, you know, just do that. Got to do it. Yeah, pretty easy. It's going to happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, teacher, could you teach us all to be obedient like you? How do we do that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just uh, stop doing what you want to do. That's hard for some people, though. Isn't it? Yeah. See, I was expecting you to just give a silly answer, but now I'm like, that's actually like, that's true. And that gets to this whole point of the Bible where it says you have to die to yourself to live in Christ. You actually just have to stop doing what you want to do. Yeah. Put yourself under submission. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's much bigger than I thought your answer was going to be, TJ. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> I think it's a good thing. That's what we're supposed to do on the show. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to be funny. Oh, well, how about this? Uh, did you see any other themes that, no. you, <laughs> that you think bear mentioning in, in these books? Uh, space bad. Space bad. Yeah. All right, guys. So just remember, um, there is value in all life. Um, humanity, as well as other aliens, might be made in the image of God. Which is something he does say. These other aliens were made in the image of God, but differently in the image of God. So that was kind of a cool random side note. Yeah. Um, Like, does God have 14 fingers or 10? Who knows? What does it actually mean to be made in the image of God? Yeah. The Simpsons think it's 10. I'm inclined to agree. Yeah. Anyway, uh, remember that uh, it is important to obey God, to know when he's calling you and leading you. And that's something that Lewis does a really good job at describing in here, too, is God doesn't speak to Ransom and say, here's what you have to do or anything like this. He's like, he could feel it, and he knew that it was what he was supposed to do. As two people who grew up Pentecostal, we are like, yeah, that's that's pretty on point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So remember, be obedient. Be humble. Don't colonize alien planets. And uh, even if evil is never defeated in our world, we can always limit it, and you can always choose to do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, TJ, you're going to rate this book zero to ten, these books, this trilogy. How are you rating them? It's hard to rate these because, on, you know, on one hand, it's they're, they're C.S. Lewis novels. That's, you know, literally four given points. They can't get less than a four. I think that's in the rules somewhere. Uh, Checks out. You can rate them as sci fi, you can rate them as uh, theology. Hmm. It's difficult because sci fi has come such a long way. That's true. I want to, I want to give them a a six and a half, but they're not that they're not six and a half worthy. Like I, I, it doesn't seem fair to give them anything less than a seven. Interesting. I would definitely rank them higher, but I I feel like your your rank your ratings are different than mine because you're not like you have a different scale. I feel like also you read more than me. I honestly, so rating it just off the story, I'd probably give it an eight. If I'm rating it off. As like a philosophical work and like how it thinks through these big philosophical ideas, probably a nine. I, I think if you're going to it for philosophy, you enjoy it more than if you're going to it for story. But you're not going to not enjoy it if you're just going for story, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, uh, that being said, are you, uh, you ready to wrap this one up then? Yeah, I think so. so. Well, guys, as we come to a wrap up. We're going to give you a couple of recommendations, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start with my recommendation. We're getting near the end of the year of Lewis. We could not cover every single one of his works. I've mentioned throughout this some of the other ones that I like, The Four Loves, Reflections on the Psalms. Today, I'm just going to recommend check out The Pilgrim's Regress. It's sort of like a parody of Pilgrim's Progress, but it's also an allegory for C.S. Lewis's own testimony. So it's a work of fiction that's allegorizing his testimony and parodying Pilgrim's Progress at the same time. And I think it's his first work of fiction. If I'm, I'm not sure, but it's pretty good. Definitely check it out. TJ. All right. Uh, I could recommend so many things. Do it. No. 
spend the next 20 minutes. Let's make this an hour long episode. So I, I will say I did. I took a long break from Elden Ring. Uh, my friend Stone came mm. over to my house and he decided he was going to play it in our living room. And I was like, huh, that's right. I never platinumed the game. For those who don't know, platinum, it just means for the PlayStation family of games, you've gotten all of the trophies, hmm. including the last one. That's what a platinum trophy is. And I realized I stopped one boss fight away from the platinum trophy. Hmm. And I just did that and then went and watched him play. Nice. Uh, and that this is to say, uh, if you haven't played Elden Ring yet, you absolutely have to, if that's what you're into. If it's not what you're into, you should try it anyway. I gotta let you know, for the last few months, it's kind of been like just on the back of my mind, a little like bugging me a little bit that you hadn't platinumed it yet. That's not true. Because I knew you were one boss fight away. We've talked about it before. Dang. But yeah, no, I did finally do it. I just let nothing stop me for seven months. Good job. Yeah. I, well, I needed to. I couldn't start my next playthrough uh, or I wouldn't be able to play with my friends. Ah. As conveniently. That makes sense. Yeah. So I just stopped then and I never did it. So you mean at any time I could have just drove to Greenville, said I wanted to play Elder Ring and you would have beat it so that we could play it? Oh, yeah, we could have, but that's not really what I mean. That's a co-op thing, but that's not what this is about. This is just recommendations. Play Elden Ring. All right, yeah, play Elden Ring, and remember, you can go to systematicgeekology.org. Hit the drop-down menu where also it says... Also, vote Elden Ring for Game of the Year. <laughs> hit the drop-down menu where it says host. You can see my name and TJ's name there. Click on it, and you can see all the other episodes we've done, including where I just asked him about Elden Ring for a while because nobody else wanted to do the episode, and I thought it was important. It's a good mm -hmm. episode. Check it out. And best video game direction of the year. Yes. And best yeah. soundtrack. Anything else? Uh, I think that's all it's nominated for. Okay. And on the that's same website, design. on the same webpage at the bottom of the page, you can let us know what you've been geeking out on, what you'd like us to geek out on, or, you know, to, to cover on the show, whatever. And, of course, remember, really important that you do this. We're all a chosen people, a geekdom of... This was an Anazal Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazal Ministries podcast network.